Uh, welcome to this second talk in our open for discussion talk uh, events. My name is Saskia van Stein. I'm a member of the Curatorial Research Collective and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, the CCR is a, a part of the Eindhoven Technical University and uh, is an interdisciplinary research and design group set up in 2016, which critically engages in theory and practice of architectural culture, its discourse and the broader societal framework. Now these talks we decided on um, because we felt the urgency to recognize a persistent problem within architecture. And uh, when we say persistent problem, we talk about uh, the lack of diversity and representation uh, at large. And we constituted these uh, talks around th three domains, the architectural education, the architectural practice and our built environment. Today, we'll be talking to Lara Schrijver and Aaron Retsky, whom I'll introduce in a second. Um, but we'll be especially addressing and emphasizing the context of teaching otherwise, so the educational model as such. We'll be entering the dialogue through the lens of the Dutch context, but probably hoovering in and out to different contexts. When we will be focusing on a systemic change that is required to ensure and enable and eventually empower towards a more diverse and inclusive understanding of gender and sexuality within architectural education, specifically addressing more towards the end of the talk, new methods and strategies uh, for learning and possibly even unlearning when it comes to teaching differently. These talks are part of an ongoing series and uh, ongoing investigations of the CCR and they're supported by Casa Vertico. So much thanks for that. Welcome to everybody joining us on YouTube also. Uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, uh, we'll have a 45 minute conversation and we'll, I'll pick up on the questions uh, when you pose them in the Q&A. So please don't pose them in the chat. So I'm gonna welcome my guests once again. Welcome Aaron, welcome Lara. I will introduce uh, Aaron Betsky um, a little bit uh, early, further down uh, the line, but for those of you who do not know Lara Schrijver, she's a professor in architecture theory at the University of Antwerp, the Faculty of Design Sciences. And previously she taught at uh, the Delft University of Technology and the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture. Um, her research focuses on uh, the 20th century particularly and um, uh, its representations, but also its theories. She has uh, been editor of Knopf Bulletin, served as editor at Footprint Journal and Oase, uh, the author of Radical Games and the co-editor of um, Autonomous Architecture in Flanders, also part of the editorial board of uh, the Review of Architecture in the Netherlands. Well, I mean, that's only part of the CV. So thank you so much uh, for joining us, uh, uh, Lara. We've asked the two of you to prepare it's a short uh, statement. Um, so I think without further ado, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Saskia. I'm really happy to be invited for this. I'm very excited about the program you all have set up because I think it's a pressing problem that remains in architecture schools, in the profession, um, and the importance of the built environment and architecture for how we see ourselves, for the values we build is to me crucial. And therefore it's also important to think about what it is that we bring into that. Now, I was luckily uh, at your opening talk yesterday and I was really happy to see the discussion already opening up about what it is that we as educators, as architects, as that critics convey precisely by all those like smaller daily decisions that we make, um, how we address others, what we wear to work, what we give attention to, how we look, how we express ourselves, what we read. Um, and in a way, these things that were already talked about yesterday, I'd like to pick up on. Uh, there was a very beautiful little statement uh, that Ariola made that, you know, um, they don't look like architects. So to start, I just want to go through a few slides to show what architects have looked like over the last, uh, oh, nearly 100 years. And I will stop at the 1970s to move on to today. So let me see if this will work with sharing my screen. Um,
and there you should have the first slide now yes it works yes okay Fantastic. so end of the 19th century the Ecole de Beaux-Arts Atelier Paulin um, I particularly like the man lying prone across two desks statistically speaking there should be at least three or four gay men in here but it's clear that there are no women um, the Atelier André in the 1920s, uh, I found two women in this photo. Um, and then we move on to the Bauhaus, also around the 20s of presentations of the uh, Josef Albers studio. There are significantly more women present here. Um, how many of them were students exactly? I'm not sure. Siam, the founding meeting, um, says everything about what we expect architects to look like. CM9, which was the start of Team 10, we see Alison Smithson fairly in the middle here, who was really part of this younger rebellious generation. Frank Lloyd Wright's studio and his apprentices. Um, about 10 years ago, they started a new project on digging up the female uh, uh, work uh, um, uh, partners in the office. So there is more to be said about this, but this photo says it all again. And then the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in the 1970s, we do really see a, a significantly more women, although many of these have kind of fallen by the wayside of history. Um, so that's where I wanna stop sharing. That's the 1970s. Um, I was very happy with the attention for the 1990s yesterday because also these references that came on, came up in the conversation, uh, Spivak, Kristeva, Edward Said, uh, these are all thinkers that I think have been incredibly important for widening the scope of how we think about architecture, what it should be, and who is licensed to practice it. Um, but these images themselves already show that really representation matters. It matters. And it matters still today. So that's one point that I would really like to bring into the conversation. What are we representing? How are we representing it? And on which levels, you know, daily and in the larger scope of what we have people read. And then I have basically, I have three other lines that to me are really interesting conversations for dealing with these issues today. Um, first is from second wave feminism. And that really started on the personal is political. And this was a radical thought at the time. I think it has expanded very strongly in the age of social media, but I think it could be worth revisiting it because when they were talking about the personal being political, they were also talking about the home front being the place where we begin to determine the values of the public, the values of the political. And on that level, the home, the family, the extended family, those are your training ground for how, where we learn to negotiate, to mirror, to accept, to challenge, to deal with otherness and otherness in the full sense of the subject. So that to me could be an interesting way to again engage with the idea of the political today. Um, then within the educational setting, to me, an absolutely crucial one, difference is valuable. If we look at those first series of pictures, there is as little difference as possible being created. And I think today we have so much scientifically validated evidence that diversity and difference in organizations, in institutions, in, in media representations also help to prevent the kind of groupthink that makes us make fundamental mistakes that it's absolutely crucial to incorporate that. And to me, that's a key feature in my teaching to talk about differences and to bring them in, to embrace them. Now, that's not always easy because throughout our history, we have painful moments where difference has become a problem. And rather than gloss over those, I think the educational space should be the safe space to discuss those, recontextualize and rethink what it means. So on that level, identity matters, but I don't see it as something that is limiting, but as something that we move forward to, that we are always reconstructing. And then finally, you know, that's a, that's a very kind of classic position, but education should strive to better us as individuals and collectively. So on that level, I think uh, if we're not making our educational spaces more diverse, then who, how could we expect society to do that? We are building the ground 
for future professionals. I think that to me is maybe where we can close. It keeps it nice and compact and I look forward to the discussion. Fantastic, Laura. These are, uh, these are really already very insightful, uh, very challenging points that you put out, Galada. Um, a man who needs little to no introduction, Aron Betsky is architect, curator, writer, director, and educator. Uh, uh, American born, but Dutch raised, art critic, um, writes on the, let's say, thresholds between art, architecture, and design. Um, I personally know him best uh, in his role as director of the Netherlands Architecture Institute, now the new institute in Rotterdam. He's currently director of the Virginia Tech um, School of Architecture and Design in uh, the United States. And to mention maybe in this context, also the author of numerous books, but two I'd like to pick up on, uh, one entitled Building Sex, Men, Women, Architecture and the Construct of Sexuality. Um, this is 95 and Queer Space Architecture and Same-Sex Desire in 1997. I thought it would be nice to mention these uh, because they tap into, uh, though written in another era, um, the conversation that still needs to be uh, asserted. So Aaron, may I invite you to give your opening statement or some points to reflect on later on. Uh, you're muted. The usual problem. Um, uh, thank you, Saskia, and thank you, Lara, for your insight. It's great to see both of you again. And I'm sorry if I'm somewhat dim in this, uh, this uh, ante room to a bar in a hotel in Venice uh, where I'm uh, attending for the first time in two years the Biennale. I'm very excited by it. Um, but it's, I, I will start with my own experience, most recent experience, um, which actually is more concerned with issues of race than it is with gender per se, but which actually touches um, difference, as Laura pointed out in general, Virginia Tech. Um, is a land grant university, a public university in the United States. Uh, these were founded based on the Morrill Act of uh, 19, uh, uh, 50, uh, 1856, uh, amended uh, again in uh, 20 years after that, which uh, gave uh, state universities a financial beginning uh, by uh, giving them rights to land that had been stolen from the indigenous people of the United States. So already there is a rather uh, troubled history uh, within the institution. Moreover, uh, Virginia Tech is obviously in the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, which was a slave state and part of its campus in Blacksburg, Virginia uh, is uh, in fact on a, what was once a plantation uh, there was a significant Black population in Blacksburg. Uh, the street off of which we live was named for a Black woman, uh, Nellie's Cave, uh, which also indicates how Black people were valued. Uh, but the, they were almost all removed uh, as the city grew and became more prosperous. Um, third aspect of uh, Virginia Tech is that it uh, had a very strong military presence. And uh, to this day, a significant portion of the students are what are called cadets, which are, means they are in army training in return for their tuition being paid. Now, why do I say all of this? Because we have a very acute racism and gender problem at Virginia Tech, one that, uh, as I have said, and some of you who, have, uh, who follow the media might have noticed, uh, the central administration does not really take, we believe, seriously enough. Um, what's interesting is that it is not on the whole racism of the overt sort. Um, there have been none of the kind of uh, physical violence incidents that have taken place in other places, but it is an attitudinal one. Um, and one that is deeply bred into the institution. It's an institution and especially our school is very traditional. And when uh, we try to bring changes to this institution, uh, when we had a black faculty member uh, suggest that possibly uh, the curriculum needed some revision, uh, one of the longtime professors 
uh, literally said to him, uh, well, perhaps your kind of teaching doesn't belong here, which is about as close as we got to an overt uh, expression of racism. The rest is done much more subtly. Uh, I have been a member over the last year of a group set up by the university called White Allies, which uh, looks uh, particularly at um, how one finds uh, the bias embedded in exactly what Lara said, uh, how people are treated, how they are dressed, how they are valued, how they are sought out for hiring, how they are promoted and tenured, how they are awarded. Um, when you look at these things from a distance, there is a great deal of bias, uh, not only uh, towards BIPOC people, but also to uh, women and uh, people of other genders. Um, what's interesting is that the school does have um, a place called the International Archive of Women in Architecture, which uh, set up uh, several de decades ago to try to exactly value women architects who uh, Lara talked about in the case of uh, Taliesin. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, Frank Lloyd Wright, who was a famous misogynist and racist, was also uh, in his quasi school, one of the few uh, to accept women uh, architects uh, in this country back in the 40s and 50s, and even before that in his atelier in the teens and 20s, who went on to be quite successful. But several of those women uh, went on to be successful, but were lost uh, to history. And now their archives are part of the International Archive of Women in Architecture. Um, the problem is, and I have uh, had some discussions with, uh, with the women who, who run this archive, uh, how does one value and judge such work? So I start to ask a certain amount of questions about um, how archives were chosen uh, for uh, inclusion and then for publication. There will be a book coming out shortly. I asked, are we looking at women who are involved in architecture in any form, sort, or shape? Do we have any value judgments about whether we think the work is good or not? Do we have any judgments as to whether they were designers or engineers or interior designers, which of course is a stereotype that uh, until very recently and, and even to this day is the position in which many women designers would put, or if they were uh, in a managerial position, which uh, these days again is happen happening uh, much more surprisingly more. Um, how do we organize such archives? And immediately I was accused of trying to impose an outdated and male-oriented point of view on uh, the collection that had grown organically uh, from the desire to value the work of women wherever they are and however they have contributed to architecture. That in turn uh, leads me to what I think is the where the discussion is today, which is we know what the fight is, both in terms of gender and in terms of uh, race equity and inclusion, um, that fight is still very hot. I, um, I would suggest it's uh, in the United States hotter around the issue of race, just because the problems are uh, much more extreme than they are in the case of gender, um, which is not to say there are not issues with gender, um, but the beyond the fight for inclusion, for having exactly the next photograph of the School of Architecture have more women than men, which already happens, interestingly enough, at the lower level of most universities uh, in Europe and the United States, and now even in China, uh, except that then women disappear from those photographs as the class moves up to graduation and into graduate school. And by the time you get to the profession, I don't know what the latest figures are in Europe, but in the United States, you're still talking in the high 20s in terms of uh, licensure. So it's still a very big issue. But as Laura also started to indicate, the fight now really needs to concentrate on the, a discussion of what are 
those values, those modes of knowledge, those modes of appearance and behavior that are or are not gender or racially typed? Um, should they be? Can they be untyped? Uh, if we are interested in the new buzzword interculturality, um, how does that address itself, not just in the way we hire faculty members and staff and admit students and support them uh, much better than we are now, uh, if they are BIPOC or of other genders than the dominant male gender, um, but how do we dig into the curriculum? How do we dig into uh, questions of the very basis on which uh, architectural and design knowledge is founded. And I just, I'm rambling on too long, so I'll just close with one anecdote, which is um, several years ago, I had the chance uh, to go to a conference in Athens and had a few hours when I arrived and said, ah, I am in Athens. I haven't been to the Parthenon since I was a student. Uh, so I trekked up to the Propylaea and made it to the top of the Acropolis and found myself standing in front of the Parthenon saying, this is indeed and truly the most perfect emblem of architecture on its site that I've ever seen. And then stopped myself and asked myself, am I saying that? because I have been through, at that point, 30 years worth of training and conditioning and looking at objects that are based on the Parthenon that, of course, themselves are based on millennia of Western male-dominated white traditions that understand the Parthenon to be beautiful on the terms in which it is, it presents itself to us. And so the very difficult question we have to ask ourselves now is how do we define what is important at the core of our discipline through the investigation that is proper to the academy? How do we include all searchers for uh, the, I wouldn't say the truth, but further knowledge about that question in that research? And do we truly open ourselves up to new modes of valuing, appreciating, judging that work with as the final question that there are those who say that even such an operation of investigative research and ascription of importance or beauty of judgment is something that is only done by male, by male white pigs and should be replaced by a completely other mode of learning. Wow, so much to touch on. Uh, I'd love to re revisit uh, this idea of transparency or more opacity when it comes to the hidden uh, systems and structures uh, in which uh, racism and sexism is, is manifesting itself in, in a bit. But maybe Lara, I might uh, uh, pick up on uh, the point that uh, Aaron put forward when it comes to the curriculum, and I'd like to tie that into maybe, if you allow me, your own education. I'm assuming that was in the mid-90s, we're sort of the same generation, so um, the idea being that, let's say, how do we acknowledge that we don't reproduce what we were taught ourselves on the one hand, and indeed, as Aaron also put forward, this belief in the, in the systems and the ethos that is inscribed in well, the designed environment, but also the theory, and most of it is rooted in a, a sort of Western, let's say, Eurocentric modernity. Um, in other words, how do you marry your own education and uh, sort of try to try to bring that '90s uh, perspective into the current debate? That that question that's really that's I'm going to unpack that in little pieces. <laughs> that's too big. Um, my education was also yeah the 90s mostly um uh certainly these kind of uh other thinkers so so we spent a lot of time in 
our architectural curriculum reading, actually, Edward Said, Bill Hooks, uh, uh, Spiva, Kristeva, you know, feminist thinkers, uh, post-colonialists, post-structuralists, and, and there was like a general sense, um, I mean, to me, it felt like a very optimistic time, like a very also happy time um, about discovering that there were so many more perspectives that we could bring in. And I had teachers who encouraged that. Um, queer theory took a fly, flight in that time. Um, and so it was, in a way, it's what I would feel the role of the academy is, and that is in some ways not reflected in the images I started with, but this, this idea of points on the horizon, places that you've never been, extending yourself to understand another. Um, and so that period to me is really important. It's formative. What I do think is that at the time, the material we were reading connected more to one another. So I think in some ways, we should maybe also not forget that we have made steps. Um, there are more women in the academy. There are more female um, uh, architects. There are in still rare, but also um, uh, um, other ethnicities that are entering the field of architecture. There, um, and and um, there are acknowledgments also. Um, Pritzker prizes that are beginning to extend to more than one person. <laughs> um, uh, so I think these things, they are, they are important. They, have, they mean that we've made steps. It doesn't mean that we can stop. Uh, the latest numbers I have in Holland is like about 23, 24% women architects registered. Um, only and 12 in education? In Sorry. education, um, well, it's that leaky pipeline that Aaron was just describing. So each step it drops down. Uh, yeah, they're in the so. Netherlands, they have a really good monitor of uh, women, female professors, and it just basically drops from. 50 to 40 at the master's level to 30 at the PhD level, you know, it just drops constantly. And I think we're talking 25% uh, women professors. Um, and then don't even get me started on women of other backgrounds, uh, you know, non-white European backgrounds. Um, that, so, so we also do have this problem and I think it's attitudinal very strongly like Erin was describing uh, also in race. Um, uh, Bell Hooks, one of those fantastic uh, uh, race, sexism, et cetera, scholars, um, really describes her first trip to Europe as her hopefulness to find that artistic free space and realizing that the way that she saw her fellow Black artists treated in Europe was not aggressive and not um, uh, 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 dominated in the same way, but it was exoticized. And therefore it was still safely put away in a place where it couldn't intervene. And so it does ask, I think a lot of these questions ask those really tough questions. Um, for me personally, what I have done is taken those many voices that I got throughout my education um, and tried to bring them into the way my students think about things. But what is increasingly challenging is dealing with that canon that Aaron is describing, because that is also part of the canon. And so to me, I would like to see a kind of recontextualization of realizing that as much as we find these standards of beauty strong and powerful, that it is also our task as educators to keep educating ourselves and seek out the other canons, the overlooked voices and the contributors that haven't been there. So one thing that I've basically done over the past two or three years, and it's very slow going, very slow going because I'm just doing it in my own classroom, but I ask students to bring in material that interests them from whatever background it is that interests them. And in the meantime, I also seek out new readings that talk about um, other perspectives that have not been included in history. And that includes female voices, that includes gay voices, that includes a variety of ethnic voices. Um, and I feel it as, I, I see it as a responsibility we have because uh, I teach in Antwerp and this is a city with over 170 nationalities. It is what we call a super diverse city. 
we have uh, young students coming in from uh, an incredible range of backgrounds who face very difficult challenges. And this goes over class, over race, over gender, and all of these various identities. So my hope is that in small ways, by at least making it speakable, that this canon is here to learn because it is an effective mode of engaging with standards of beauty, with changing ideas, but that this canon is not set in stone and that it is our task actually to expand it. Yeah. And I hope to bring my students into that task as well. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and Adam, a lot of the examples that you've put forward, they deal with, um, let's say, a set of power relations to a certain extent, anything to do with from the grading system or the tutor student or uh, the architecture in a broader uh, field, the canon in and of itself. Um, do you have any um, insights in where where or how these could be unhinged when it comes to the to the to the practice or the educational system do you have examples that are hopeful at all or because you paint quite a grim picture well, i don't mean to uh, uh you know the world is is not ending it at least the world isn't ending it will soon be unhabitable for human beings but that's a whole nother discussion um i am not sure. This is why I am myself um, more speculative. When you ask for a statement, I thought I'm not going to make a statement. I'm going to speculate because though an anarchist at heart, I'm not sure that power relations in themselves can be avoided. Um, and however much we might want to see the academy as a collection of minds sitting under a tree, uh, which is where the word comes from, the Grove of Academy. Of course, they were all uh, wealthy white men who were sitting there. Um, and there were power relations sexually there as well. However much though, I would like to dream of some place of equal learning there will always be this sense of uh, precedence, uh, if not power, because of the knowledge that a faculty member or a teacher will bring uh, with them. Uh, that is then increasingly these days countered by a sense of entitlement by students uh, as the educational system in, in the United States becomes more and more um, expensive, um, we get more and more messages, not only from the students, but from the parents uh, saying, we're not getting our, our value. And we are the ones who are paying, we are the clients, uh, we have the power here. So it creates uh, power relations that are very uh, disparate, one that is based on knowledge and authority and one that is based on the presumed financial one. Now. Against all of that, I would hold that. I believe that uh, the American university, uh, particularly the American university that is campus-based, still remains a very viable, important uh, example of how one might develop alternate power relations. The, the, American campus, though it is based mainly on British models with some admixture of German and French uh, influences, by the middle of the 19th century, really had focused on the notion that the university was not merely a place uh, to engage in uh, learning, either a trade or a profession or a body of knowledge, but rather that it was a temporary community that brought together at that time men uh, from all walks of life, uh, from all backgrounds and molded them together in one place that was enclosed and enclosing where they lived and worked as students, where they became part of a set of traditions and where they built an effective community. By the 1920s, 
that had been further articulated with the notion that the American campus was in fact the engine of a self-renewing society. Because by bringing these people together from disparate backgrounds, having them all become part of a tradition that involved them in learning and searching, but also taught them thus how to become a community, a group of like-minded people, they could then form an effective elite when they went back out into the world in whatever area they chose. And in so doing, and this is the, the, the dream of the liberal arts uh, degree in the United States, they had spent four years not necessarily learning a profession, because in fact, you should go to graduate school for that, but learning how to be a citizen and learning how to be member of a community informed, educated, all of those enlightenment ideals you mentioned earlier on, Saskia, um, and prepared to work together towards the improvement of society and themselves. Um, very romantic idea, very much under question because of the exclusionary nature of uh, the university. I would argue that for all of its problems, the university is still extraordinarily open uh, compared to most other institutions um, and is a broad pipeline towards entering into a wider, uh, wider societal possibilities. Uh, also very much under threat because of professionalization and cost, but nonetheless still standing and still effective, uh, I think, more than any other model I know in terms of creating community and community values and exactly allowing for the kind of debate uh, that we are having. Let's not forget that discussions about identity, gender, race are currently and have for a long time been headquartered, sheltered, cherished by and furthered by the academy and particularly in the United States by the liberal arts uh, colleges. So I hold the campus as a model, as a place, as an ideal very high as one way that we might uh, begin to address some of those relations. Yeah, and this talks back to what uh, Lara was saying about the, the idea of make, creating a better, uh, a space for bettering, um, uh, for lack of a, a, a better word. Uh, I wanted to touch base on, on, on how, to, how to recognize these, um, these, these systems that you were mentioning earlier and feel free to, to jump in or when, when I think back, I was re reading some of the parts of your publications where it was obviously about uh, identity and sexuality and how that, how identity production, I'm talking about your own publications in the nineties and how they sort of play out into questions of the interior exterior, or I was, I was sort of dreaming out loud uh, this idea of cruising and anonymity in the city in relation to the smart city, or there's furthering that discussion with the um, uh, with the online uh, dating apps and all of that. The, the question I'm trying to pose is this relationship between um, how to recognize uh, these systems of oppression, and then in order to and 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 which tools can we provide for uh, for young students to. Yeah, to start to start altering these conversations, um, or obviously altering the, the profession from within. Because the question I had also while preparing for this is that students also come with an idea of the profession towards mm. the academy. So maybe it's also about how how to unlearn. Or I'm I'm, I'm projecting here, but maybe I can jump in here for a minute because I really think that to me a teaching practice is incredibly rich because you have all this material you know we can we can hand our students the books that Aaron wrote to at least open up the discussion of what it means to be gendered or sexualized or 
uh, pushed into an identity that may be partly desirable, but maybe partly not. And um, I've been surprised a few times by my teaching practice, um, uh, you know, anecdotally, where I was uh, offering up students an article by Donna Haraway written in the in the mid 80s on this uh, called the Cyborg Manifesto, where she really take, takes on Marxism, technocratic uh, critique and feminism and all of these kind of uh, new technological uh, ways of shaping identity and sexuality. And I reread it after I put it in the syllabus and thought, oh, this one's going to be a tough one because it is really full of that kind of discourse of the 80s. And to my great surprise, I had a student who took that one up. He got in front of the class uh, the week after when he had to present. And he said, I'm so glad with this text. This has like blown my mind and it's opened my world, you know? And, and he was talking from the perspective of a, a student he had come in on an Erasmus and talking from the perspective of someone who was struggling with uh, what it means to be male, what sexualities there are in the world, what it means to be not of the uh, Western or at least the American and European world. And all of these things, these were like puzzle pieces that were just part of his daily questions to himself. And he was just blown away by Donna Haraway and so thrilled that he got to read it because it gave him words to articulate something that he had been kind of mulling over. So to me, that's like rewarding to see whether it's like one or two students you reach, but, and, and it's, you just try with texts that open up new views and you never know if it'll land or not, but, but sometimes there's a student whose, whose perception is changed. And that's really all we can do, you know, one student at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I and on the oh, long, sorry. the long term, the timelessness of these things. So they come back. Your books will be circulating again and again in the academy. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I do think that there is. Um, th there's there's several other issues. One is the question of language, yeah. and one of the problems that I do see is. Um, that every uh, wave of uh, doing battle against hegemony develops its own language. And the problem is that that land language becomes hegemonic and exclusionary. And it obviously has happened in the last 10 years again uh, and has earned the popular monocle of cancel culture and various other kinds of names. But I think there is an issue and I think we have to work hard to try and state things plainly and to avoid that kind of jargon. The other thing is that we have to, um, the, the other difficulty is that since it is still a war or at least a um, conflictual situation, um, being forced to take sides sometimes is very, uh, is very problematic. So I think we have to acknowledge that not all women architects are great architects. Mm -hmm. um, just as we need to recognize that some male architects are and have been pigs and deserve in fact to be excised from the, uh, from the community as someone like Richard Meyer was. Not to equate those two, but we have to open ourselves up to a debate that is not just um, based on, if we want the debate to be wider mm -hmm. and more deep and not just about the immediate violence that women and people of color face, which we need to address, which needs to be first and foremost. And if, but while we are fighting that fight, if we're going to have a deeper conversation about where such acts come from, what, arouse, what allows that violence to arise and happen unchecked still to this day, then we need to have a more open discussion about sexuality, race, roles, and we need to try and do so in a language that moves beyond the kind of uh, uh, 
battle hymns mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the, uh, the struggle for uh, diversity and equity. Yeah, but that's actually, yeah. I, I'm kind of curious. So the American campus, um, uh, you know, I, I see battle lines being drawn a lot where there is that kind of oppositional position that if, if the wrong words are used, the discussion is flattened. And um, I think that is also sometimes at play here in Europe, perhaps a little less radically, because I think also the, the radicalness of the struggle is perhaps a little muted, but that doesn't mean it's not here. And I mean, I, I struggle this with this, like in terms of as a reader and as a teacher, but I'm not sure that there is I can't, I can't think of a better way than to, as you say, speak plainly and speak explicitly sure. and try and do that as much as possible within the education. Because after that, when you enter the world, there are extra regulations, habits, structures, power relations, uh, the need to keep a job. And so um, how, how do you see that happening out in the American classrooms? Because I'm, I'm sometimes very nervous in my theory courses because sometimes I do put forward questions of identity of race, et cetera. And I try to do that in the most kind of open way that everyone feels able to speak plainly, but in an 80 person lecture hall that is never self-evident. Um, so I, I toe the line a little, and I think if I were in an American university, I would not dare do that because the, in my experience, the, the kind of, um, say, uh, guardianship of what is okay or not okay to say is stronger there. Do you find that? Well, I think it's, again, let me give you sort of a concrete example. What, what I run into is that when, when people bring up uh, my building sex book, the first of those mm -hmm. two books, um, or queer space for that matter, um, I have, I've been told that uh, some teachers uh, do not recommend the book, which is fine by me. It's a 30 year old book and was not meant for an academic audience, but they don't recommend it because they, feel that it furthers stereotypes because in the book I point out that women were largely excluded from the architecture profession and therefore found themselves working in interior design and decorating mm -hmm. yeah. and made huge contributions which in the book I argue we should value more fully and I was very hopeful at the end of the book that those influences might come into architecture and improve it. Um, I don't think that my hope has been uh, has been wait, uh, has been fulfilled, but the the quest now is to find women architects. Sometimes, however ob obscure, however wherever wherever they can be found, uh, as is the same search in art history and in literature history. Um, and my argument is let's find where women were doing really amazing work mm -hmm. and let's look at that and find ways of up judging that like upcycling that uh, rather than trying to create traditional role models mm -hmm. uh, by finding women who somehow managed to have a profession uh, somewhere um so and that in itself the, presents many challenges because yeah. actually in in flanders um somebody recently discovered that actually an archive of a really talented graphic designer was just simply slipped into her husband's archive because uh, he was well yeah. known and yeah. so in itself that presents challenges yeah, yeah. that's but you know then you get to the whole uh, you get the whole problem of someone like lily reich mm -hmm. or you know or many collaborators of architects who in fact did more often than not interiors and furnishings. Yeah. And yeah. therefore the credit was taken by the big male architect. Yeah. So now we're reevaluating them, but we are pretending that they were architects. No, they were interior designers and we should be proud that they were interior designers and we should value the work as much as we value that mm -hmm. of Le Corbusier, 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we should so, not pretend it's in another profession. I'm going to jump in because time is already running out. I want to, uh, for the people out there want to pose a question, please feel free to jump in uh, and pose the question in the, in the Q&A box, uh, which has been opened by the host. And um, I, don't, I just wanted to pick up on this question of being precise and being, uh, and, and because one of the questions I had in mind was indeed uh, the hindrances uh, when it comes to accessibility of education, on the one hand, um, the, the, the financial, but also the language. And I noticed, um, because you are, if I understand your plea correctly, is to be very precise and nuanced in how, right, to not come up with generic, generic terminologies. Uh, but I'll share an anecdote because around this notion of of, uh, of fear or judgment or morale even. I was listening to the acceptance speech of um, Madeleine, Madeleine von uh, Friesendorp uh, for the Ada Louise Huxtable Prize, which she received in 2018, which she, she entitled, Me Neither. And I noticed that I was just like the first three, sec three minutes of the conversation, I thought, can she appropriate the Me Too in such a manner? Or is that okay? Like it became this whole, um, question as such, of course, she was hinting at the existing hierarchies and her being uh, written into history rather late and uh, the, the lack of representation of women. While on the other hand, I uh, have encountered quite some female practitioners who definitely do not want to be uh, seen as a female architect. So there's also this kind of, um, yeah, dilemma of positioning or positionality that apparently um, one wants to be read as a, as a proper and good architect. That's it. But see this, but this is an issue that I've had for a long time because a proper and good architect, you just say that as if, you know, we know what a proper and good architect is. We create what Fair a proper enough. and good architect is. And, and I think one of the discussions that needs to be had is who is defining what a proper and good architect is. And I, I would welcome more attention for, for I mean, even, even tough discussions on whether we find something adequate or appropriate or good or beautiful or, um, and, and less about you know, the person. But I do think we have to get away from that kind of visionary architect discussion. I mean, Aaron, yeah. you know, the, the architect is made by teams. Yeah. And, yeah, and I think the small way in which that's happening, a very, and I, I was trying to figure out, someone was urging me to do a follow-up book, which would actually be about uh, husband, wife, architecture teams. Uh, Lakaton Basal, Saarbrück mm -hmm. Hutton in Europe, uh, Diller Scafidio, Williams Chin, Koning Eisenberg, just to, and you can just reel them off. It's become a big thing uh, starting in the 1990s. And I think it had a lot to do with uh, what was going on, what Lara described. And what's interesting in those partnerships, it is often quite difficult to figure out uh, when the journalist goes and say, okay, who really designed that? Who's the lead that, architect? Exactly. You know, who's the hero here? That's a nonsense question. We need exactly. to help people it, get away from that. Yeah. And so I think that uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, in, in our own case here at, uh, at Virginia Tech, uh, we've had one uh, uh, academic couple who were trying to retain, not sure if they will stay, uh, Cruz Garcia and Natalie Frankowski, who are trying to bring that very model into the academy and really want to teach together and have taught all of their classes together. Um, we would like them to try and split up some time and see what that's like. Uh, but for them, that is very much a model. And so I think this notion that we are moving away from authorship, uh, mm -hmm. from sole authorship uh, towards, in, in fact, as Lars says, team authorship or, or team creation is uh, one of the ways forward. Yes, yeah, that's um, um, already, I would say nearly a wrap up. I'm very sorry, we just basically started to scratch the surface, but I was gonna ask about reputation or fear in, the, in that sense when it comes to not, not positioning um, uh, as either a female or a queer uh, uh, architect. But that said, um, I see there are no questions, so it's clear as a fiddle apparently, even though we, <laughs> touched upon many, many different things. Adam, you mentioned that you are um, at this point uh, in, the, in the Venice a biennial, um, uh, a biennial that you actually curated in 2008, if I'm correct. And now uh, Lebanese 
uh, architect or overall architect, uh, a curator, um, uh, Hashim Sarkis has posed a question on how will we live together? Mm. Uh, what are you expecting actually to sort of find or learn or are you, what are you looking forward to? Uh, uh, people. <laughs> <laughs> People together. Uh, no, I, you know, of course, everything is colored right now by the fact that this is this is my first international trip uh, in a year and a half, and uh, it's very strange. I, I don't know. Um, I still think that there is uh, a, a foundational value in experience. That, and that's why I felt it was important to go through all of the tests and the rigmarole and the special permissions to get here in person. Uh, because I think that is the great good of the Biennale is its ability to bring people together in one place to share an experience that is focused around architecture or every other year, art or film or, or dance. And um, it is always, it is never one experience. One thing I learned as a curator is it doesn't matter what you say your uh, Biennale is about, how you choose the participants, um, how, you, how many lectures you give, uh, people are gonna do what they do and what you see will have more to do with what is going on in the culture, um, what the central concerns are of all the participants than what you happen to think uh, it is. And then of course, there's a layer of what uh, all of the critics will tell us we really experienced and, and saw. And of course I have to be one of those as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming here with an open mind. It's very strange to be in Venice with so few people. Uh, I actually walked into San Marco church for the first time since I was a student because I could, and it's there, and it's incredible. Uh, so much like a mosque, I'd forgotten, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, so I'm looking forward to, to those experiences. Yeah. Thank you also, Lara, for your uh, uh, very challenging and provocative points uh, out there. We uh, wish you all the best of luck with uh, furthering uh, the practice and the good work. With that said, I also acknowledge all the other people and institute and communities that uh, practice and engage and further and catalyze the conversation on, uh, on diversity and inclusion uh, within the architectural realm and beyond. Uh, we stand on, uh, on the shoulders of many. And um, that said, I would uh, like to thank you for joining. Uh, this will be revisited, this talk can be revisited on a YouTube channel of uh, both Casa Vertical and the CCR. And uh, for those of you who are curious about the next one, May 25th, my colleague uh, Justin uh, uh, Agjin will be addressing reframing architectural education through the lens of an ethnical and cultural perspective. So thank you for joining today and um, see you somewhere in a more diverse and more inclusive world.